you can kind of convince them that you hadn't exactly noticed that that was their enlightened self-interest. It was just a wonderful coincidence that they wanted to do something so socially beneficial and it would have this added benefit um, that would really benefit them politically as well. And honestly, I think this is what the LGBT movement has achieved in recent years, and I'm, I'm not among their lobbying core, and that'd be kind of fun. Um, but they've found a way to convince, say, the Republican Party that its desire to portray itself as being more socially inclusive can be achieved in part through uh, granting greater leeway for civil rights for LGBT people. So, uh, and and this point, it's falling through broken glass for people who really don't deserve it, and always apologizing when they did something wrong, all those things. If I had a lot of campaign money to hand out or I was running an oil company or something, like this is my take on that, it would probably be very different. But coming from a sort of grassroots perspective, that's, that's how it worked best for us. Somebody else had their hand up again. I think we did. We did get the Wildlife Trust Fund through the legislature on the second try in 2005. Uh, so I think there was some impact. But that took a real coalition building. There were over 20 environmental, sportsmen, and conservation organizations involved in that. With the tacit support of the uh, Game and Fish, the wildlife managers for the state. And it came at a time when Wyoming was experiencing a real fiscal boom in oil and gas royalties coming into the state. And they were looking for ways to put some of that money aside in a permanent manner. Uh, without either spending it on something that was going to take it off the table forever or without locking it up in what's called the Permanent Mineral Trust Fund, which is a sort of state fiscal vault that money can't ever really come back out of. Uh, but I think the real impact, the real grassroots impact in 2005 when that passed was because there were hundreds of people who had bona fide credentials as landowners and as hunters and anglers and uh, who owned lodges or were part of the tourism business that while the wildlife viewing drives in Wyoming were able to put their support behind it and create this, this is definitely the appearance and I think the, act, the reality of a deep ranked, broad based coalition of people with different ideologies who all agreed on this one policy concept. That sells itself. And so the real work of the lobby goes into identifying these people who can create a, a very diverse picture of support for something and motivating them to believe that they can get up in committee hearings and they can give little speeches for three minutes and they can go on the radio and do an interview and so forth and getting them over their, their nervousness about being up in public speaking and, and voicing their political opinions in the public sphere uh, is an enormous part of social change work. So every one of these types of clubs that exists out there increases the chance of social change by, by lowering the inhibitions on public speaking for ordinary people. The, the time may come in your life when you're involved in some public policy issue that you can draw on your confidence in public speaking and you can advance it in a way that you may not have been able to otherwise. Yeah. You've done many different types of public speaking. Which one would you say would had the greatest consequence, created the most good influencing other people? <clears throat> wow. Um, that's a very thoughtful question. I think... Where I feel the greatest satisfaction and maybe a sense that something has changed is when I will go out. People know about the Laramie Project. This is a spoken word play where uh, a theater company from Brooklyn went out to Laramie after Matt was murdered and interviewed hundreds of people about their lived experience of the days after Matt's death, their thoughts about the gay community, how Laramie has changed, how it has not changed. Uh, and then they did a sequel 10 years later and came back and interviewed many of the same people again and some new people. It's amazing work of spoken history. It's the actual verbatim transcripts of interviews from ordinary people who are real. Um, so these are put on all over the country. It's one of the most produced plays in American high schools. It's second up. In one year, it was second only to Our Town, which has got like an 85-year head start on it. Uh, so we go whenever possible, especially to larger productions or big audience productions, and we will lead discussions after the play is over and the audience in large numbers will stay behind and spend another hour doing Q&A with the director, with the cast, with the foundation staff to learn a little bit more about what they've just watched. And what they want to know is, was it really like that? And I'm, I'm not one of the people that were interviewed in that play, uh, 
so I am often asked for my perspective on the things people say. But what people really want to know, I think in their hearts, is if this happened in my town, because these crimes happen everywhere. There hasn't been another one in Laramie, Wyoming. There's been dozens in New York City, which is a very gay-friendly place. Um, but they can happen anywhere and do routinely, hundreds of them every year. Uh, if, but if this happened in your town, here, or where you grew up somewhere else, how would that town react? Would it learn? Would it turn inward? Would it turn on its gay community? Would it open itself to diversity? In, in most cases, all towns that experience this do all of those things. It just depends on who you're talking about, what segment of the community. So when we lead those discussions and can really try to turn questions from the audience back to the audience itself about how they would react, would they react any differently? I think that's the most important and compelling public speaking I'm able to do. I also speak, I give a speech at our gala every year and everyone's in their penguin suits and stuff. And I work really hard on that and I don't feel like it makes a ripple in the pond at all. Because people expect me to do that. I run the organization, I'm supposed to be on a podium talking to them and they're all there for our annual fundraiser. Um, it's the unexpected that really is powerful in spoken communication, I think. It's saying provocative or thoughtful things or the joke that just drops in that you weren't expecting variations in tone and tenor, facial expressions, things that shock or grab the audience and make them think, and takes them out of their role as a spectator and puts them into a dialogue. Even if it's me talking to 15 people, we're each individually having a dialogue here potentially, but I can't hear most of you or half of those conversations. So whenever you can do that, that's, that's the magic. That's what you're looking for, for sure. This concept of slacktivism is talked about a lot, that clicking like on something means you've done something. In, in a very small sense you have, I've run an organization like this. We have 59,300 and some likes on Facebook, which is a small town in Wyoming, essentially. Uh, but every time that number goes up, it makes me happy. <laughs> so something has been achieved when people click that. It just doesn't change the world that much. We've tried to learn how to use our social media because it's grown enormously. We had four, I've been doing this for less than four years and when I started we had like 11,000 likes on Facebook and everyone was very proud that we had that many. And a lot of effort had gone into it. Uh, we had about 47,000 people that subscribed to our email newsletter that we send out every week. And our web traffic, people who come to our websites, a couple hundred thousand of them a year. Um, and that was how our audience stacked up. And so we thought about our audience in that way. We'll communicate through the website. That's where the biggest audience is. We'll, the pearls of that will be harvested weekly for these heat blasts that we send out. And then we've got to really remember to get on Facebook and update that content more regularly because we do have a following there, some of which is unique and doesn't follow the other two. Um, well, now it's inverted. We have our largest audience is Facebook, then the heat blast, and then the web. The web numbers are high. But in terms of unique visitors who aren't already encompassed in the other two groups from what our tracking indicates, it's a small, it's a smaller audience that only uses the website. So now uh, petitioning, getting people to tell their personal stories, We've, we're working to recruit 20 new youth bloggers for our resource site, uh, matthewsplace.com. That was all done through social media. Uh, we've spun Matthew's Place off to have its own Facebook page so that a dedicated daily stream of content for people who care the most about that can be generated. And we're getting people to sign up to you know, either weekly or monthly produce blogs about their individual lived experience of the LGBT community and their part of the world. Uh, we have a couple of people from Egypt that want to do this now, which was really eye-opening to realize that our audience actually extends that far. Um, so the type of, you know, we feel people's voices are their most powerful tools. So the type of activism and activation that we're looking to achieve is to get people to use them. And to some extent, you never quite know if they are. But through sharing, uh, we try to post something inspirational or just infuriating about LGBT current events every day to get people to share it. And that's a form of using the voice. It's echoing the message that's out there. Um, getting civil discussion to occur on, on social media, I think, is a challenge that's going to take a lot longer. There, 
that sort of discussion tends to dissolve into either echoing or bickering really quickly. And the more controversial the topic, the more angry it gets. So um, I gather that if I figure out a solution to that problem, I won't become a millionaire because every site that is trying to build a community online is dealing with that same corrosive aspect of anonymous commenting that's out there. But uh, we're, you know, we have a strong interest in bullying and in reducing harassment and, and hateful behavior generally. So we're, we're always trying to think of ways to get community standards to prevail in, in online discussions. But I'll let you guys know if we figure that out. It'd make it a lot easier to read stuff on blogs than it would be that we're going to run into a miasma and make it a comment at the end of it, though. Anybody want to know about the teleprompter? Does anyone use the teleprompter? <laughs> So you're here, and there's a, a monitor with a mirror image of your text in white on a blue black background, and there's one over here as well. And the glass is highly polished and angled inward, so you're looking through the mirror image of your speech on blue background scrolling on glass, which you can, it looks from the audience like you can totally see through it, but it's real hard to see through. <laughs> it's very, the, the glare, especially if you wear spectacles, is very hard to see through. Uh, but it's important for the purposes of stagecraft to appear that you are looking straight through it and maintaining eye contact when there's this glass <laughs> thing in front of you with words rolling on it. And then there's some like, there's some like 63 year old retired gal who used to work at the TV station who is over here behind a curtain who is hand turning the speech while listening to you. And if you're a garrulous kind of person like me and you throw in an ad lib or you, you glance at it but you paraphrase the paragraph rather than read it verbatim, because it's so much better. I mean, nobody wants to watch somebody read on the telephone. It's awful. Uh, then she has to figure out what I'm doing and stop the script until I give her a cue that I know she did that and I'm picking up the next sentence the way it's written. So she <laughs> speaks again. Um, and you're doing this in a darkened room where you're floodlighted. Um, some of the light is coming through these panels. And it's just, it's a trip. If you have an opportunity ever to like take a tour of a local TV station on a slow news day in the sort of early afternoon, uh, sometimes they will let you use these things. So, uh, and in those cases, they're usually, uh, they're usually flat screen and they're uh, just below or even mounted kind of against where the camera is so that you can appear to be looking straight into the camera while you're actually reading. You can track the eyeballs as they're doing this in some cases, but uh, that is the absolute hardest thing I've done in public speaking. I'm most comfortable, like this is, this is what I was prepared to say tonight, and I know what these things are. And I'll talk about them in a way that makes it, the faces looking at me seem to be interested in what I'm saying. And when they're not, I'll move on. I can try to refer to it. Um, but reading your actual speech as text is the most dreadful thing ever. I don't know if anyone's given a speech from paper. God. I finally learned that on those occasions when I was going to have to do that, I had to not only rehearse the speech, which, you know, duh, you want to rehearse the speech, but I actually go through it with a pen and underline the syllables I want to hit the hardest in my, in my emphasis and my diction, and I'll use parallel lines to break sentences where I want to leave a pregnant pause in the middle of something. I have to actually sort of diagram my speech up like a piece of music so that I can give it in a way that will be effective and I don't have to read it off the page. Uh, that's the only way I think I can get read from a prepared text. But when it's, they don't let you do that with the teleprompter, it's all in the pod. So that's another challenge. Rehearsal writing a lot of things is also helpful for the public Give us um, what you think are the most important tips uh, in order to be a good public speaker. 